How's everybody doing today? It looks like most of the world got the message that the meeting did. How we doing? does in fact start at 12.30, even though it's now 12.33. Um, so that's my call to order. Welcome, everyone. Do we have any introductions? Should we go around? Sir? Let's go around. I'm Barry Barker. I'm with CART. And I get to share this wonderful group. John Black, Oldham County Deputy Judge. Bernie Bowling, City of St. Matthews. Matt Minier, City of Jefferson Town. Jeff O'Brien, uh, Louisville Metro. John Callahan, Louisville Metro. Beth Jones, uh, KYTC Central Office. Tom Hall, KYTC District 5 Office. We'll right, jump in. <clears throat> Justin Taggett, Floyd County. Don Lobb, Floyd County. Brittany Montgomery, Town of Clarksville. Andy Crouch, City of Jeffersonville. Jim Moody, Indoc. Keith Griffey, Bullock County. Jim Urban, Oldham County. Ashley Davidson, Kipta. David Burton with Kipta. Mary Lee Power with Kipta. Lori Kelsey with Kipta. And of course, that's Kipta. Sarah Bain with Kipta. Andy Rush, Kipta. <laughs> Amanda Dethridge with Kipta. Nick Bale, Kipta. Mr. Robinson, Congressman John Yarm's office. Stephen Devitt, Burgess and I. Lori Pacino, City of Mount Washington. Steve Miller, Congressman Guthrie's office. Mark Lower, the Congressman Guthrie's office. Tim Emmington, Tri Mark. Bobby Campbell, Jacoby Tunes, the last engineer. Bob Stein, United Consulting Engineers. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, first order of business the uh, April 28th meeting minutes. Everybody said, I know everybody's read them religiously and poured over the punctuation and everything else. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Darn, you were the one who were counting them. Um, do I hear a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Do we have any public comment? I have asked. Beth Jones to make several public comments here, <laughs> or more like public commentary. He's fascinated with my Happy Meal toy from today, so just so you all can see. Angry Bird. Very nice. <laughs> nice. Good job. Good job. Okay, come Thank on. you. Okay. Now this is the second part. You're oh, and, and the costume, in case uh, anyone. I'm looking forward to taking this back to Frankfurt amongst all the UK graduates. <laughs> Public meeting report, Ashley. Okay. Um, on May 10th, we uh, participated in the International Association of Public Participation webinar, uh, Tools and Tricks of Online Engagement. Um, on May 12th, David and I gave a presentation to the National Association of Retired and Veteran Railroad Employees. And on May 13th, I was at the Urban Heat Island Symposium. On May 20th, we were at Old Global Spring Fest, and tomorrow we will be at the Spring Conference for the Kentucky Association of Government Communicators. Questions, comments? Staying busy? We are. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, so that if we can shoot it down again. Ashley, Ashley's going to do a, uh, a reprise of the uh, final leap in. Uh, At the end. Out of uh, the movie with uh, Nobody Keeps Baby in the Corner. <laughs> what, the, what the heck movie? Was Dirty that? Dancing. Dirty <laughs> Dancing. That's where it was. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, bring a little levity and life into transportation. That, Connecting Kentuckiana focus it? areas, David? Uh, Adam and I are going to tag team on this one. Now. We're going to be talking about our uh, latest activities relative to the Connecting Kentuckiana uh, Metropolitan Transportation Plan update. Um, we've, we've shown you quite a bit over the over the last year or so, and we want to kind of show you where we are right now. What we want to talk about are uh, focus areas. And we're going to kind of explain what those are, how we've developed them so far, and then why we've developed them so far, and how we may use them as we go forward. Uh, 
the information that we're going to be talking about is nothing new. We have gone through this with you guys several times, several different opportunities, and talked about a range of pieces of information that are important uh, to the update of the transportation plan and trying to identify <coughs> issues. So this is just a quick slide of the types of things that we have looked at over the, over the, over the course of, uh, com, uh, of getting us to this point that we're at right now. We've also, uh, the, this committee approved some goals and objectives for the transportation plan. We have a, um, a um, performance management plan, an issues report. Several key documents have come together to bring us to the point that we are now where we want to start talking about how we identify projects and what projects we identify for the update. Um, so that's, we're at, at the beginning stages of that right now. So we have lots of good information that we pulled together into very succinct documents that we think will help provide the, the, a good foundation for us to like begin looking at what are we gonna do and how are we going to address the issues that we've identified so far. But what we have is we have a lot of good information, and there's a lot of <coughs> what we need to figure out a ways to focus our attention on how we're going to use that information so that it begins to make sense, so we can begin to tell a story. So as we go forward with project development, priority review, and performance management, we can do so in an orderly fashion that we cover as many of the needs that we identify. So if we, if we take some of these reports, some, some of which are ongoing, uh, and start to apply them to identifying projects, what we're proposing right now is a, is a first cut. Basically, we would take the high crash analysis, the congestion analysis, the issues report, and pull in what we've been using all along, which is GIS, to help us figure out where we need to focus our attention and how we need to address the issues that we've identified. So the basis for the focus areas that we're trying to introduce you to right now are the high crash analysis, the congestion analysis, and the issues report, all very critical pieces um, to this point. And we're going to use this information to define <laughs> focus areas. Where, is there, where can we get the biggest bang for the buck? Where is there the greatest need? What corridors do we really need to start with when we talk about making transportation improvements? So the focus areas are, are going to direct project development. They're going to help us to figure out where we need to look first. They're going to provide opportunities for multiple low-cost, high-impact improvements. Where can we uh, make efficiencies by uh, combining efforts in order to address an issue within a focus area? The focus areas are going to be a good indicator for establishing project priorities. How well does a particular project that's been proposed for the MTP, how does that affect a focus area? Or does it? That may be another question. And then when we do uh, our, um, our um, uh, uh, performance review, this, these uh, focus areas will help that because they're based upon things that we consider very important as we go forward. <clears throat> So what we're talking about doing right now is focusing and talking about focus areas, focusing on the focus areas, drilling into those right now and trying to get a better handle on where we need to be looking. But that's not the only source of projects. We also have other issues that are going to be found outside of these focus areas that we're going to need to address. Those issues that address the goals or the targets that we've identified um, and make sure that we are, are, are uh, taking a look at those. And then there will be other projects that we'll bring into the, into the program as well. The intent is, again, to ensure we have solid project development, we have good priority review, and we address the targets that have been identified by the TPC as we begin to build projects into, our, the, uh, into the, uh, MTP update. So the focus area is one of three, but it's the most important. So when we talk about the high crash locations and the congestion and the issues report, we're going to bring everything to bear in trying to figure out these, the, the, these focus areas. And basically, 
what Am is going to talk about in just a second is, is the process he's gone through using GIS to look at proximity and weight to just figure out where we need to address these focus areas. But Andy has talked on several occasions about intersections and roadway segments as far as, as, as high crash analysis is concerned, bicycle <coughs> and pedestrian use. We've talked to you about level of service, looking for the worst areas of level of service, and then the issues report you've seen multiple times. Uh, and the several areas that we've talked about when we talk about issues. If you recall, that was that 41, those 41 TADs where, you, where we drill it down to a very local level, trying to identify gaps in the pedestrian network, where there may be some maybe issues related to getting to work or getting to uh, going shopping or medical facilities or getting to parks. So that issues report is also going to be playing a very important role as we go forward. So now I'm going to hand it over to Adam, and he's going to give you the nuts and bolts. <laughs> okay. Uh, so as, as David was talking about, uh, we we started with certain uh, base files and, and, and base uh, base things. On uh, we looked at the top 40 intersection crash locations in Kentucky. Uh, all this is stuff that we've uh, brought to you before. Uh, I'm just going to show them to you on the map. And then we did, uh, so we threw in Indiana, we looked at uh, pedestrian crashes, uh, the bike crashes, and then the Indiana segments and Kentucky segments. Uh, we have shown you level of service in the past, uh, but this, in this what we did was we took the worst of the worst. Uh, there were 300 or so road segments that uh, I believe were a D or an F, and what we wanted were the top 10% of those to get the, uh, you know, the worst areas of congestion. So, all right, so basically we ranked them from uh, high to low, anything above one, uh, well, is anything above one and F, is that what it was? Yes, if the, the volume to pass through ratio exceeds four and that okay. represents low service F. So these uh, represent the uh, 28 highest uh, congestion issues that we had in our region. Uh, so this is what we used to, to build the uh, focus areas. Uh, just the, the basic elements. Um, so what I did was, just like what we did in our uh, TAD reports and the different cluster analysis things, uh, I took those areas and I buffered them by a quarter mile, uh, which <coughs> gives you essentially this. And then uh, what we did next was we took uh, the different categories and we applied a weight to them. Uh, the, the weight was a little different because if you look at like the bike and pedestrian crashes, they were over a 10 year period uh, and there were significantly less number of crashes than were, than uh, was it like 10% or even less than that was it? The bike and pedestrian? Yeah. Uh, they constitute the about uh, 1%, no, so not more about, than 2%. Well, okay, so about 1% like overall. So, so we gave them a, a lesser <clears> weight. <throat> for uh, bike crashes, we gave them a score of 10. And for pedestrian crashes, we gave them a score of 15. And then uh, the vehicle uh, segment crashes and intersection crashes, we gave a, a score of 25. Those were over a three-year period uh, uh, from 2000, I believe, 9 to 2012. And then for the level of service, uh, it was a uh, one-year average for 2015, and we gave those also a score of 25. Uh, so we took these areas and we looked at where they overlapped to try and you know, come, at, come up with these focus areas. Uh, if you can, they're, diff they're different colors by what kind of uh, area they were on the worst of the worst or in crashes or congestion. Um, so essentially what I came up with was, <coughs> if you look at those, each one of them had a, was assigned a weight, and then I basically just did a cluster analysis to see uh, how they were within a quarter mile of them. Uh, and so you had the original weight, and then when you added everything that was within it, you got a weighted sum. So we took those weighted sums, and here I'll just I'll color code them for you so you can sort of see it, I'll zoom out a little bit. Um, so basically kind of the lower end of the, the weight was uh, up to 100. 100 to 200 was kind of medium, and 200 and above were, uh, there was a, a lot of overlap in a lot of uh, you know, different categories that fell into that, that uh, uh, area, so uh, that's what we were looking for was to you know try and get as uh, many uh, you know see where they're clustering, where they're grouped together. Uh, 
so then the next step was I took those <coughs> periods and so I drew a boundary around them. And when we got the boundaries around them, uh, I took everything that was inside the boundary. And this is kind of the final, final step to see what we need to keep and what we didn't need to keep. Uh, there were actually a few other boundaries originally uh, that didn't make the, the final cut. And what we did was inside each boundary, we looked to see uh, how many occurrences were there. In the top one, there's uh, 26 different uh, bike intersection segment uh, congestion and pedestrian crashes. Uh, and it, uh, when you added all the weighted sums together, you got 5,740. Uh, there was, if you look this one up here, there was only scored 100, so uh, it got thrown out. Um, it was significantly lower than the rest of them. And so we went from a range of uh, having uh, this, this least one had uh, four different uh, categories within the boundary, and uh, like I said, went up to 26. Um, so this is what we've decided for our, our focus areas. Um, the focus areas are just uh, kind of like the, uh, the high level uh, look at you know, where to maybe prioritize things. Uh, we also uh, are going to show you, uh, like in the PAD reports, it was kind of a local level. So this is more of a regional, that's more of a, a local level on uh, you know, where we could uh, create projects that would help the region more as a whole. Um, all right, so kind of, does anybody have any questions about any of that? I mean, it's kind of, I, I probably didn't explain it the best, but is there any questions I can answer? My only question is, uh, I, it looks like we're not including interstate. Other than okay. okay, right, yeah, we did not include the interstates and the interchanges in this. Um, we figured they were a separate animal, something that would be, uh, uh, projects would be generated separately with, you know, with the different uh, you know, transportation divisions and whatnot. Um, and uh, is there any other questions? What, David used proximity and weight. Is that what this map is? is right, that, yes. So this is, the proximity is that, you said quarter mile? Right, if we, I'll zoom in the... Like say an area. And then the weight is the formula where you, mm -hmm. on that chart. That right, on. so uh, these for example are worth 25. The uh, bike crash in here was worth 10. Uh, this <coughs> one was worth 15. So if you take the sum of all of those together, uh, that are within, they were all within <coughs> a, a half a mile of each other. And that's the proximity, right. they're that's, clustered yeah, that's together. The that uh, developed, the, and that's how we came up with this boundary. So like in this instance, uh, you know, these are kind of connected, so we just sort of rounded it off and then close it in. And, and so are we at a priority level yet with those? <coughs> Hi. You know, in other words, you've got these clusters. Is the next step to prioritize those clusters? Right now we're treating pretty much each focus area as its own unique issue. And there may be, right now we're focusing on crashes and congestion, but the degree of crashes versus congestion between the different focus areas kind of makes it harder to, to say one is more important than the other. Now we do have the scores, but the scores and the, and the, and the values that were added that were just trying to help us to segregate where we need to focus our attention. And then, uh, so kind of on the, on the next steps uh, topic, um, because there's going to be a lot of important things that are outside of these focus areas, uh, we're also going to look at, say, goal areas. Uh, this intersection right here, you zoom in, scored the highest on our uh, intersection analysis. Hmm. Uh, it's a uh, new cut and uh, outer loop. So on our crash analysis, it scored the highest. So we, we're not just going to throw that out. I mean, it, they all go into it. Um, so it may turn, it may or may not. We're also going to look at, say, what we call them, like goal areas, goal intersections, areas. or, or things like that. Uh, we're going to work on developing those next. Um, and then the, all those are going to be based on the clustering analysis we did for the TAD. Uh, it'd be, so it's kind of like the, the second look uh, of things. And I'm just going to show you an example, zoom out and show you an example of how some of those uh, TAD report things fit into this. Um, so we have the environmental justice areas. 
Uh, a lot of them are covered, but you know, there's also some areas around the priority <coughs> corridors that obviously we'll want to look and make sure we don't negatively impact. Um, we have freight access areas. Uh, again, they're they're pretty much surrounding the uh, the focus areas, so we need to look at how things go through the focus areas to make sure that uh, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously in those focus areas are is congestion and crashes and and uh, safety issues. So we want to make sure that you know we address those. Uh, schools is another one. Employment, uh, and then. Uh, if we look at all the public comments that we've received uh, during this process, um, you know, we want to make sure that we address those issues because that's what the you know the public mm -hmm. sees as, as a problem. So uh, it, it's all going to be related and all part of the process, uh, but we're using these areas to kind of show where we can get uh, more bang for our buck. Mm -hmm. So this is this would think of this as the first step, the first cut in trying to figure out where we need to begin to start. Where we need to start making improvements. It doesn't exclude any other part of the region. But we, as we've been trying to say from the beginning, we, we don't, we do not have an infinite amount of money or planning level funds available to us. So we need to be able to make sure that as we as we program those funds in the UTP, we're looking at where we can have the best impact. Uh, and this is where we're going to start. But that's where we're going to grow out from that area. And it, like Adam had brought up some of the TAD or the issues report materials, like we picked one of these focus areas and we've identified, and we've identified issues that may you know, exist within those focus areas, we've got to keep those in mind as we identify projects. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to bring all the work that we've been doing at this point together so that we can have a really good project development process for the MTP. Questions? Further comments? Good stuff. We'll look to the future on that. <coughs> Participation plan review. Ashley? There it is. Okay. Um, we are, I'm here to talk about the participation plan. Uh, it was adopted in 2014 by the TPC, and uh, it states that we will be reviewing it annually, so this is an annual review of it, but we won't be updating it until every four years unless we have uh, necessity before then. Um, what we've done is I've put together a little brief report on some of the things that we've done and um, I'll talk to you about that just so you can gauge the effectiveness of what we've been doing and that's what this presentation is for. Um, some of the ways that we monitored what we did for participation in 2015 was um, Adam put together a GIS analysis with maps that depict all of the places that I went to in 2015 and that map will also show the Title VI areas, the EJ areas, and um, after we look at that map, we'll talk a little bit about the um, social media and what we've seen on our social media, as well as the results of a community-wide survey that was sent to everyone on the TPC and TTCC, and um, the comments that we've received throughout the course of the year. So, in 2015 to 2016, we went to over 50 events throughout our community, including schools, business expos, festivals, community organizations, and environmental groups. This is the map that we have, um, and if you will, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but we have um, another map right after that kind of zooms in. So, the pointer is not pointing for me. It doesn't work? Okay. So, use the mouse. Okay. <laughs> the, the big circle in the middle indicates that we went to seven or more events there, and then the smaller circles around it, some here and there, those are the, small, the events that we didn't go to quite as many. And if you see a red dot on the map before here, which you can see there's a couple of red dots <coughs> on the map, that indicates the events that we got the most comments from throughout the course of 2015. The most uh, events that we attended were in Jefferson County, but we're always happy to go to other counties. We're looking for ways to engage our other counties. Any events that would be 
wise for us to go and engage the community. I'm happy to attend and always looking for ways to reach out to some of the other counties. So over the course of 2015, at the events that we went to, we did get a variety of comments. Um, we had the most comments come in about bicycle and pedestrian facilities in the region. Uh, the second amount were transit related. The third amount were street related projects, just comments that people gave us about potholes or areas that they thought needed work. Um, we did have 8% of people bring up light rail and the other 13 were just various other comments that people had. <clears throat> so when we get the comments, just to show what we actually do when we're gauging our participation, when we put together the participation plan in 2014, we heard from the community, some members thought that our meetings should be held on a different day or at a different um, time of day. So we put together a TPC logistics working group. <coughs> The TPC Logistics Working Group, some of you all were involved in, we met four times, and in the course of those meetings, there were TPC members, KIPTA staff, and um, concerned citizens. We talked about the time of day the meetings were held, and where the meetings were held, and which day they were held, and as a result of those meetings, we are now recording the TPC and TTCC meetings. So, the community, uh, the community spoke, we had their comments, and their comments were used to um, have our video and meetings. They're now all on our YouTube channel, so if you haven't watched them the next day after a meeting, they're always posted, sometimes the same day, just depends on how long it takes them to load. We have a, a couple of different online platforms where we monitor the success of communication for KIPTA. Uh, the first would be our website, then we have a Facebook page and a Twitter page. Uh, that should say 2015, so 2015 through 2016 um, on kipta.org. We had 61% new users and about 39% returning users. Uh, the page receives a lot of views. That's for the community, or that's for the Kipta page as a whole. Uh, we are always <coughs> one of the top things that people search for when they go to the Kipta page. And um, the average session only lasted about two minutes, but we have, like I said, returning users who go there frequently to look up plans or um, different documents that are listed on kipta.org. On um, Facebook, we increased the likes by 24 people. Our demographic consists of 51% women and 47% men. And if you look at the charts right there, the um, Analytics will show that the most popular events are generally when we're out in the community and I'm posting from the community, not when I'm just sharing or retweeting somebody else's information, which brings us to Twitter. Um, we have more than 100 new Twitter followers. That demographic is 54% women and 64% men. Uh, again, when I'm in the community, if I'm at U of L and I'm posting something from eCoachella, generally that's when more people will look. There's pictures and you're in the community and it's a little bit more engaging than just sharing someone else's post or retweeting them. So, the last few weeks we asked you to participate in a community-wide survey. It's the first time that we've done that since 2011 and it's to gauge what we are doing right and what we could improve upon in community involvement. We had 19 questions and they all were pertaining to transportation planning and participation. We had 73 responses come in. Um, they had, uh, we had responses from all of our five MPO counties. The majority of the responses came from Jefferson County, but we did receive comments from Bullitt, Oldham, Clark, and Floyd counties, as well as some who were not in the KIPTA region so that would factor into the total number of responses. And some people didn't put their zip code on the survey, so I'm not really sure where they took it from. Um, the majority of the people who participated in the survey were, quote, uh, they considered themselves citizens. After that, we had local government, and then other and freight came in just behind that as far as the participants of our survey. I'm happy to report that 
the majority of people who took the survey said that they were aware of KIPTA's regional transportation planning function, but as you'll see, there were some people who were not aware of that, so there's room to improve in that category. Uh, uh, have you viewed any of these in the last month? The website seemed to be the overwhelming page that people went to to find information when they were looking up KIPTA. Facebook had uh, about 50%, and then just behind that was the Twitter page, and we're still trying to gain momentum with the YouTube page and get people to watch the meetings on there and check out what we've been doing here. So in conclusion, we don't have any recommendations to change the current participation plan. We hope to have future meetings talking about the participation so we can measure the successes that we've had. And at this time, I would ask for an approval of the report on participation and uh, action is requested. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion, comments, questions? Any, are any of your uh, things you put out into the space, uh, are the actual uh, commentary by people like yourself, like Larry, that are actually speaking about programs, about issues, about things like that, because I think sometimes when you put out a bulletin like that, it's coming from somebody whom, like, give the community an overview. I think it might be looked at maybe more so. Do we do that? Like a, uh, some type of information I'm like, about... I'm like saying putting a, putting a camera on Larry and putting that up on Facebook as a as a as a you know a segment if you can do that i don't know if you can do it or not but i know in our county judge vocal does a lot of that and he's he's for communication for information stuff like that so that's what i'm asking to maybe get more readers and lookers and stuff there are mpos across the country who <coughs> sometimes do um, a monthly report or a quarterly report about mm -hmm. things that are happening that's something we have discussed possibly doing we also have discussed putting together a, a video that would explain more um, elementary for the entire community to understand what an MPO does because you understand that, that's why you're here, but sometimes when you go in the community it's hard to explain it in a concise way that's really easy for people to understand. So that's something that we've looked at doing and if we did put together an informational video we would have that on the KIPTA homepage and on our YouTube channel. Um, because right now, people can watch the videos on the YouTube channel, and if they have questions, then they would just be directed to ask us about those questions. But I think that makes a valid point to make it easier for people to understand and share what's happening here. Further comments or questions? We have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Eyes have it. Thanks, Ashley. Um, Kentucky Highway Functional Classification, Lori Kelsey. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I know that there are many of you who, uh, who attend both our technical committee meeting as well as this meeting. So if you were at our last technical committee meeting in October, uh, you, would, uh, you would have uh, uh, been in on a discussion of functional classification, particularly the Kentucky functional classification. So uh, for the benefit of those who may not have seen that presentation, we talked about methodologies and timing and uh, you know what exact essentially what we were going to need to do in the process. I'll, uh, I'll give you a little overview here. Okay. So as it says, functional classification is essentially a framework. Different roadways perform different different roles. Those roles range from the very lowest level, providing access to local land uses to mobility functions, which would be our interstate systems, providing mobility uh, not only across town, but maybe across the country. So in this case, and for, for Kentucky's roads, KYTC, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, they maintain and update the functional classification system 
for all of the roads in our state, in Kentucky. Uh, KYTC asked the MPO, which is us, and the local governments if they uh, would like an opportunity to provide some input to this process. And that local input was provided primarily by some of our T uh, TTCC members. The box that is up on that is up on the screen that is essentially the different levels of roadway functional classification. Uh, as I was telling you before, up at the top we have the interstates, whether it's in the rural area or the urban area, the interstates are providing that mobility function all the way down to locals at the bottom, which are providing that access to local land uses, local, local uh, subdivision streets, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then over on the left, we have the, the roles of federal highway versus the state DOTs. Uh, federal <clears throat> highway, they set the criteria. The previous slide, here's, a, here's an example of the uh, latest edition of the report that actually uh, sets that criteria from Federal Highway back in 2013. And then Federal Highway also has the ultimate approval. DOT, they maintain, the DOTs maintain and update their individual systems. Oh, and you also notice uh, in the box that these functional classifications are divided out by urban versus rural classifications. Uh, the, they're based on the federal aid urban area boundary. The last one, uh, the last update of that boundary, uh, the adjusted urban boundary, uh, was actually approved by Federal Highway in 2014, and that was based on the 2010 census. Many of you may recognize this slide as well. What sorts of things <coughs> prompt the changes to those roadway functional classifications? As I said previously, with each decennial census, that federal, uh, that federal aid urban area boundary, it changes. So some roadways, it, it, it may contract, it may <clears throat> expand. So some of those roadways that were urban become rural and vice versa. So, so there may be a functional classification change necessitated by that. Land use changes. Uh, those land use changes, if, if you have some large traffic generator that either comes online or, or maybe shuts down, unfortunately, uh, that can change the traffic patterns in the area, thus necessitating some sort of change in the functional classification. Then you have roadway system changes. Uh, additions or, or additions of roadways or, or closures of other roadways. Let me give you an example. An example of an addition, um, New Chamberlain Lane in Northeast Jefferson County. Uh, when New Chamberlain Lane came online, Old Chamberlain Lane doesn't quite serve the same function anymore, so now the uh, classification of that roadway should change. Also in uh, Oldham County is Kentucky 393. That's another example. When the new Kentucky 393 came on, old, old 393 was lowered in classification by the state. And then changes in criteria. I showed you that report put out by the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, an example would be urban collectors. It used to be that uh, in the urban area, if uh, roadways were not <coughs> broken out further than uh, in, in the collector, in the collector uh, category, they were not broken into minor collector or major collector. Let me give you an example here. See, now they're major collector and minor collector. In the urban area, you used to just have collectors. Okay, so they've changed that. So those changes need to be reflected in the new functional classification. In some cases, it may be, now that we have minor collectors available to us, it may be better to either down-classify a major collector or to <coughs> up-classify a local. So you'll see some of those in our, uh, in our functional classification changes. So let me give you some examples. This is the current 
functional classification in Jefferson County. And those colors, let me go on back, those colors correspond to these colors. Now what you're not going to see on any of these graphics today, you're not, or, or in the lists that were in your packets, or we have some extra lists over uh, where uh, Mary Lou is standing and holding them up in case you did not get one in your packet. But uh, we will not be discussing any changes to interstates or expressways. There were no changes to interstates or expressways. However, there were uh, a small number of changes to principal arterials, uh, many, many changes to minor arterials, major collectors, and then new designations <coughs> in the urban area as minor collectors. Okay, so this is where we are here as of May 2015. And then to ref reflect the lists that you, that you have, here's the revisions. The suggested revisions. And these revisions include <coughs> For example, the, the very uh, uh, very heavy red that you see sort of in the center of the graphic, those are those uh, facilities of Brownsboro Road and Shelbyville Road. They've been reclassified up to principal arterials inside of I-64, or excuse me, inside of I-264, rather than uh, major collectors. There's an example. Uh, out in the, I'll flip back and forth here a little bit. Out in the eastern portion uh, and in the southeast and the southern portions of the county, you see a lot of new yellow showing up. And essentially, this is where uh, we can take advantage of reclassifying those local roads to minor collectors. And so that's what you're looking at primarily there. And then over in the western portion of the county, uh, West Louisville, downtown area, you see it changed from uh, minor arterials to major collectors. And a lot of these were suggestions from uh, KYTC. So that's kind of a little summary, as, as good as I can do with the graphics we have for Jefferson County. Oh, is, that a, is that a function of just how much traffic is on each road? What? In, in some cases, it's, it's a function of the, of the volumes or the adjacent land uses or uh, just whatever, whatever the function really is of the roadway. I don't know, Tom, I think Tom may have worked on a little of this too. Well, the easiest thing I think is there are very specific <clears throat> definitions for each class of those roadways. And if you read that definition and you're familiar with the roadway, you can really get a sense of What's, which classification that road fits in. It just seems like a lot of roads were <clears throat> moved up one or two classes in this. I, I didn't know if there was a some, some were, a some changing were. of a definition of, the, of each classification or if there's that much traffic on each one of them since the last classification. I'm just curious. Some were, but then some were also bumped down. And because in the in the new manual that I that I'm flipping back to, in the new manual they they also uh, the state has some percentages of mileage for each of the functional classifications. They that they have some percentages that they have to uh, kind of bear in mind. I guess I'll say as they're doing this. So you 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 can't you, you're not supposed to be top heavy, so to speak, in any one particular classification. One of the yeah. significant changes was that Federal Highways came up with a new definition. There used to be this level of road called collector. Yeah. It didn't right. matter if it was urban or rural, it was just collector road. Mm -hmm. And now they split that into two classifications, rural and urban. So all of those roads, we had to go back and decide, is this collector road rural or urban? And a lot of times that's just as it has to do with if it's in an urban or rural area, but we still had to make, go back and make that change on every one of these roads. So it probably looks like more change. Than that. That's why I was wondering if it was a definition change, maybe that caused some yes. of this. Yes, part okay. of that is the definition change, and, and one thing, one thing as well that really, uh, really contributes to this in the collector area. The collectors on these maps, just to make it simple, are are the yellows and the greens. 
those are those are the collectors. The minors are, are yellow and the majors are, are green. Um, before this last classification, a methodology that, and, and I know Indiana and that did this as well, where they reclassified all of those urban, kind of did a, an initial classification where all those urban collectors automatically became major, urban major collectors so that they could fit them into the new system that they've right. done. So, what, so that shows up as a change. But in some cases, what it may be, it may be a change from collector, from urban collector, now to minor collector or major collector. So it's not necessarily that those roads right. that have changed have seen a vast increase right. in traffic. It's, it's it a combination of all of these okay. is what it is. So there's, there's Jefferson County. And then when we go to Bullock County, here's Bullock County as it looks right now. <clears throat> Then we have the suggested revisions to Bullock County. And in the northern part of Bullock County, um, over, uh, over towards the Jeff Forest area, uh, some of those changes are local roads uh, being classified up to minor collector in order to, uh, in order to uh, actually have some continuity across county boundaries. <coughs> With Jefferson's, with Jefferson's uh, either existing or revised system, and then there were also some uh, suggestions in the Mount Washington area, as well as uh, down near uh, Kentucky 480. Those were suggested uh, with <coughs> local consultation, and then there are some others that were that also came from KYTC as well. So I'll flip back one more time. That's current, and here's the suggested revisions. Oldham County, there's our current. Okay, and here's the revised suggestions. In the southern part where, uh, where Oldham uh, meets into Jefferson, essentially what we're looking at is, is again continuity between, for the most part continuity between the two, uh, the two counties, the functional classifications. And in the very center, You'll see where, you, where we had a, a blue go to a, a yellow. That's, that's that Kentucky 393 example I was giving you before. The new roadway, the new, the new roadway has been, is, is, is in there, and so now the old, essentially the old right of way, the old roadway has been de is going to be down classified. Uh, yes? On that first line, speaking about that, <coughs> I'm not sure exactly what what all this is. One the CR 1199 Centerfield Drive. Centerfield Drive is what is now the old original highway, State Highway 393. Yes. But Oldham County is taking that back into our system. Is that what this is saying? What? No. Essentially, what this is saying is that. Okay. Um, and then the, also right next to that, uh, ma'am. Yep. That ex, extend number one. I think that should say Kentucky Highway. Actually, Kentucky, Kentucky 393, correct? It's 329 is down in Brownsburg. Oh, yes. And actually, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that was me putting in the extents because the original data that I had uh, was actually a GIS shape file. So I, in order to try to make a list for you folks to have something to look at, because I, I couldn't really send you out some maps. So having a list to look at, I'm the one who put in the extents. So that's actually a, a, an error on my part. It should say 393. Okay. You, you are correct on that. And then as for the, as for the first point, the, uh, the, old, uh, the old 393 piece uh, was classified as a major collector. And what's being, what's being suggested is that it be downgraded to a minor collector. And that's that. That's really all it is. It's just uh, it, it, it. It's not going to affect uh, any any ownership of the of the facility. I guess there's two sort of systems attributes. There's who owns it and what does it operate like. Right. And all this functional class stuff is what does it operate yeah. like. Yeah. Just just the latter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not trying. No no one's trying to give you. Uh, <laughs> 
a piece of roadway that, that uh, you But if you want to take some state roadway, yeah. <laughs> probably don't facilitate that. Yeah, I was going to say, Tom, Tom and Beth will talk with you afterwards. We took that one now and got put in a $300,000 bridge on the gym to meet mm -hmm. federal standards. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you gave us a road that needed a bridge, but we took it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in this That's one, you see good. that pretty much the graphic takes up uh, all of the screen, but all we really have within the metropolitan planning area that's that's under the purview of the MPO is actually the the the, the piece that uh, that sticks out uh, over in the uh, over to the west, the little piece that sticks out. That's approximately that little piece that sticks out is approximately four square miles, and that's and that's all we're talking about. Um, in that area, we really didn't have a lot of facilities in there to look at. Um, there's actually only uh, I believe there are like three through roads that are in that area, and two of them, I believe, are already functionally classified. Three or four, most of them are classified. So here's, here's the suggested revision, is just to bump up that minor collector status to major collector status, going from the yellow to the green. And that was, uh, that was actually a uh, KYPC uh, suggestion. Okay, so... After all of this is said and done, um, essentially uh, action is requested on this item. And uh, what we're asking is that TPC approval of the revisions, as you have in your list, or as you've seen on the maps on the screen above, uh, T TPC approval of these revisions, that would signify the MPO concurrence with the revisions. And uh, it would then be a part of KYTC's <coughs> submittal to Federal Highway. At that point, they would be able to uh, go on and uh, submit those changes and receive Federal Highway approval. So, thank you very much. Lori? Yes. I have a question. Are you going to be doing the same thing on the Indiana side, too? Yep, you're up next. Okay, I was just wondering, because I know we had, it had been a while. So. Yes, it has been a while. The, 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 there are certain things that kind of trigger... Um, this is not considered a major, major overhaul necessarily. Um, you know, we didn't, obviously we didn't start from, from a blank map. Um, but one of the things that necessitated this was, well, a couple of things. One being the, the change in the classifications of, of what's a, the available classifications from Federal Highway. And, and of course the biggest thing was probably that urban rural facilities change because of the change after the census to our urbanized area boundary. But yeah, Indiana's up next. Uh, Laurie? Yes. Question. Um, a few months ago, I think you circulate some maps and for us to view. Is that part of this as yes. well? Like public yes. works? Yes, this is the culmination. This okay. Is, this is the I culmination. remember Dirk was collecting all the comments from Jefferson County and then Yep. added that to you so they have reviewed yep. this and, okay. that, and that they did okay yes. thank you and there, so so uh for jefferson county there was uh jefferson county various folks had eyes on it yeah public um, works and and within kytc the uh, central office as well as district five had eyes on right. it so um, okay. this is the culmination of all of that do i hear a motion Good. so moved second second Further comments, questions, observations? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Barry, I've got just, well, Lori, Lori unrelated yeah. to this. When are we going to uh, look at the TAS information? I know we've That's kind of. That's up next, too. On the list. Yes. Didn't want well, no, it's next. I just didn't say when. <laughs> All right, at this point in the agenda, we're going to uh, have uh, Jeff O'Brien with Metro Louisville do the Move Louisville presentation. It's only going to be like the third time I do it this week, so it's going to be great. Thank you, Barry, and Larry, for inviting me out to talk about Move Louisville. Um, there's two versions of this presentation, so I was doing the math in my head as to who's seen, who's seen what version. So I'm going with version two because I think that, I think that more people have seen version one, except for Barry, who's seen it both. 
one that you'd like to admit, probably. Um, so uh, on April 14th, the mayor announced the release of the MOVE Global 20-year uh, strategic multimodal plan. Um, and so I'm just going to give uh, just kind of a brief overview of this. We are in a 60-day comment period for this plan right now. So uh, if anybody would like me to come and get their organizations, their city, a more in-depth review of MOVE Global, I'd be happy to, to facilitate that. So uh, here we go. Um, so MOVE Global was a project that was a collaboration between Mobile Metro um, and TARC. We received a large federal grant for this project, a dirt going. Uh, did the put that application together? So this was a project that was uh, that was managed by jointly by Global Forward and Public Works, um, and then as I said, Tarka uh, provided financial uh, backing for the plan and also participated greatly in the plan. Uh, we hired a lot of the, the background work was uh, done by Nelson Nygaard, which is a consulting firm. Our our reps were out of the Atlanta office and they were uh, shipped to LA during the middle of the process. So challenge for us. So when we, when we, when we look at Move Global, one of the challenges that we have in Jefferson County specifically is that we have, um, our transportation is supporting a lot of good things, but this West Main Street streetscape was something that uh, we did, uh, we put $3 million into the streetscape and saw <coughs> quite a bit of economic development happen behind the sidewalk. And it's supporting a, a vibrant urban environment, um, this morning, uh, economic development is still allowing people to move uh, throughout downtown Louisville. Too often in Jefferson County, our uh, infrastructure looks uh, looks has, has more like this. This is out on Dixie Highway, uh, where we have a broken sidewalk. We have a, a bus stop uh, with a shopping cart in, in the middle of it. Um, and it's not really supporting uh, what our citizens are telling us that they want. Um, so, and this is of course getting fixed, but uh, nonetheless, it exists that way today. So again, just to kind of set the stage on Move Global, this is a project that came out of uh, the Vision Global um, initiative that the mayor launched in 2012. The number one comment that we heard when we did Vision Global in 2012, 2013, from our citizens was that we need a better transportation system. We need a system that is focused on bicycles and pedestrians, we need a system that is focused uh, on transit and not just focused on, on automobiles. So not, not, not all the stuff, not in spite of automobiles, but this stuff in addition to automobiles and the freight movement. So Move Global was the first project that was launched out of the Vision Project. Again, that was facilitated by a large grant from the federal government. Uh, and the funding source for that was the TCSP. Um, <clears throat> Our six primary goals of Move Global uh, number one, we need to fix our infrastructure first, and we'll get into that a little bit, in a little bit more detail. Uh, the next is we need to reduce the vehicle miles we travel and improve connectivity through Jefferson County. Um, the third is we need to move goods. Louisville is a logistics hub. We have no, uh, no freight policy for moving uh, freight on our surface streets. We have some, <coughs> truck res some restricted truck routes throughout the community, but we don't have an overall uh, policy for how we move freight around our city. Uh, we need to improve the air quality of our community. That's what we do a lot of this for, is working on those congestion mitigation projects. Um, improve health and safety. We, uh, Andy should have showed the nice map of where all the bike and pedestrian crashes are in the community. And then finally, we need to improve access to jobs. When we think about jobs in Jefferson County, this is how we, how we compare to, the, um, to, our, to our regional peers. Um, we are. We have a lot of the a lot of low wage job earners that cannot necessarily afford to own a car and get around the community in a car. And we have some emerging job centers, specifically in the eastern part of the county, uh, where we're having trouble getting citizens to us. So when we when we, our economic development team goes out and is uh, and trying to attract a business to come to Louisville, they find that they love property, <clears throat> loving the properties, but they're not necessarily able to get their workforce. To, uh, to, the, to their jobs. So the other end of that is the higher wage earners. Um, we're, we're in a position right now where Louisville needs to be attracting uh, the higher wage earners from other cities. Um, the, the luxury cities that people can't afford, we're hearing a lot of this and we, we do all things from the Urban Land Institute. Um, but this is actually happening in our community and they're coming to Louisville and uh, having some trouble being able to locate because uh, we, have, we have some centers around the community, but in certain cases the built environment that's not necessarily uh, supporting what they want. So people coming from New York and Chicago, uh, these larger cities are coming to the global, not necessarily finding the neighborhoods, the transportation options that they want. 
So we started the new global plan with these seven goals. Uh, uh, these goals were all based on the, the vision global goals, except for the two notable excep exceptions here. The first is fiscal responsibility. When we do a large visioning ex exercise, fiscal responsibility is not necessarily we, um, we're, we're thinking as number one priority. Uh, and then the other is equity. Um, and again, Vision Global really had equity as a theme throughout it, but we were very specific that these are going to be two things that we are going to look at when we, when we look at our transportation system and the multimodal nature of our transportation system. One of the challenges that we have in this community, uh, I alluded to this, we do have a, we do have a challenge getting people to jobs, uh, specific, especially if they don't own a car. So our average commute time in Jefferson County right now is just under 22 minutes. It's 21.8 minutes. That rises significantly if you're riding transit. It's closer to 30 to 45 minutes on transit. When we, when we think about Jefferson County's commute time in comparison to um, other cities across the United States, we have a low, low commute time. But uh, again, again, looking at the, the transit, there is quite a disparity uh, between people that have a car and use that car versus people that do not have cars. So what's happened in our community is we have uh, we have this great road network. Uh, we have we've had job centers that have gone out from uh, from the downtown area and the center part of the city, and which it's really great. It's giving us a range of jobs, a range of uh, a range of economic activity in the community. Uh, but we're not necessarily having people live living around uh, living around where they live. So one of the primary goals of Move Global again is to provide that access to jobs, really improve that connectivity. So if we can increase the number of people that are living around those job centers pretty moderately and, and reduce that commuting time, that is one of the one of the primary goals that we have. Again with our with our with our infrastructure, when we look at how we are commuting to work along, and this is coming from the uh, 2013 uh, American Community Survey by the uh, these are the five year estimates Lori, so you see know, just so you know that. Uh, we are, uh, these are how we are commuting right now. 82% of Louisville are, riding to, are commuting to work alone in their car. That's high from a national average. When we look at our regional peers like Nashville and Indian Indianapolis, uh, they're, they're, a little bit, they're higher than that national average too, but amongst the three of us, we are the highest. Um, so we do pretty well on carpool. That's thanks to the good work at Kipta, their Ticket to Ride program. We, we're pretty competitive there. Uh, transit, we need to get we need to get better at, at transit. We're we're behind the national average. <clears throat> and when we think about why that poses such a challenge to us, again, we have we have a lot of people driving to work, and so we have these demands on our road network, expanding the road network. When we think about what Louisville Metro's responsibilities are to maintaining our road network, we have a backlog of projects, uh, maintenance projects that is two hundred eighty-eight million dollars. <throat> and so this is why. Fix it first has got to be a priority for us. One hundred and twelve million dollars of that uh, of that of, of that uh, two hundred eighty eight million is paid in a loan, and then our annual maintenance needs just to maintain what's on the ground today is just about eighteen million dollars. So we think about that eighteen million dollars a year. That's not touching the uh, not touching that maintenance backlog. And when we look at how we are spending our dollars, our metro dollars. Uh, for the for the last five fiscal years, we're we're appropriating about fourteen million dollars. So these are the funds the Metro Council is appropriating out of the capital fund, our formulaic funds that are coming through the state, municipal and county road aid funds, and then dollars that are flowing directly to us uh, from the federal government, either through CDBG or other sources. So we are spending <coughs> about seven point three million dollars on average for maintaining our system. We call it system preservation in the report. Uh, we are spending a, we're spending another 28% on our bicycle and pedestrian network. That is re really reflecting the large investment that we are making in the Louisville Loop. And then 20% of our uh, pro of our funding is going toward uh, road capacity projects. So we have a pretty balanced approach, but we are uh, pretty low funding. I will say that this we when we ran these calculations, we did not include the fiscal year 16 mid-year appropriation, which was which did have a large amount of or. Uh, for infrastructure and that appropriation. Uh, that was just due to timing. And then we also did not include bonds. The city CFO, Daniel Brock, really wanted us to look at what can we rely on in the worst case scenario. We've had some pretty lean years at Metro for uh, capital investment and transportation. So on the other side of this, on the operating side, uh, Barry and Tarek annually have to go and find $10 million to plug their, to plug their budget. 
Um, they are finding that through non-renewable revenue sources, such as grants, with the move global recommendations, uh, we, are, we are recommending adding an, an additional $20 million per year on top of that. So we have a total need, uh, we think, for $30 million in operating expenses. And that's really what, that's really what our citizens are telling us we want. So uh, when we look at the, the bare bones transit that, we, that we're, we think we can provide in the next 20 years. Finally, and, um, we are getting ready to undertake a comprehensive plan at Global Metro. That's something that uh, Emily Liu and uh, I are working very closely on. Um, one of the things that one of the primary recommendations from Move Global was how can we get our population living in nodes so that we can facilitate transit-oriented development, so we can facilitate our um, we can facilitate uh, the, the connections that we need. We really focus the development around those high capacity corridors. You kind of notice there's the light gray outline. And uh, this is well, probably not coincidentally, but that was that's kind of the primary redevelopment area. That was also the focus area that uh, Andy had thrown up there. A lot of that is is kind of synced together with that. So I guess we did a good job last night. <laughs> um, so what what these dots are, indicate are areas in this community where we have nodes of activity. So our, our Nelson and I went, went around the community. They looked at all the properties in the community. They really um, deleted all the areas that are exclusively single-family residential, so areas where we have a mix of industrial, commercial activities. And then where are areas where the land value is primarily, is, is primarily exceeding the improvement value uh, on, the, on those properties? And then they said those areas are places where you could have some change, you could add some density, uh, you could add some more activity and really, really start to focus your growth. So that is something that we will be taking to the community um, and as we go through the comprehensive planning process. And so when we think about creating quality of place and, and what those nodes could look like, we're thinking about mixed use nodes, thinking about complete streets. I know this has a pretty picture of a brick median bike lanes, but just a, a, a vision that Nelson and I are to put together for us. And really, if, when, we, when we modeled this on the, on, the, on the regional transportation model, we looked at if we could grow more compactly under, under this scenario, we could reduce our, our, uh, our um, VMT daily by 500,000 in Jefferson County. So our daily VMTs are 19 million or thereabouts. So 50% of our trips that we take in this county are less than three miles. Uh, and I think another third of those are less than one mile. So targeting, if we can start to shift some of those trips to uh, transit or uh, bicycle or walking trips, so certainly those one mile trips. Think about those last mile strategies, really. The other thing, part of, the, part of that challenge there is uh, getting better at doing complete streets. When we think about how uh, Metro has, has accomplished its capital improvement projects, we, uh, we have a complete streets policy. We were an early adopter of that. However, we not, have not really fully implemented a complete streets approach to capital projects. So uh, that's something that we really need to get better at. We think is key when we talk about making those improvements to the transit network. A lot of places that we are that we're looking at transit improvements, we have poor sidewalk connectivity. So how do we get people to those bus stops? Dixie Highway is specifically one of those where we have a significant portion of the neighborhoods that abut Dixie Highway that do not have sidewalks and cannot connect to the, the uh, large transit investment that we're uh, in the process of making. Uh, finally, I mentioned the movement of goods. Looking at our surface freight routes, again, the, the freight routes in Jefferson County are crucial for two reasons. The first is uh, logistics is a, is, a, is a top industry in Jefferson County, and what happens is, is we lose time and money when we send trucks circulating around our, our local neighborhoods. And so that reduces the quality of life, but we also end up with real health and safety issues where we send large trucks down Eastern Parkway under the Third Street Viaduct, which they can't make. And I think that's a weekly occurrence where we have uh, an issue at that, at, that, at that viaduct. So really kind of thinking about how we uh, improve that freight network and get that information out to, um, out to the community and get, uh, get truck drivers to the interstates as fast and efficiently as possible. So again, the, with the goals in mind, we developed 16 priority projects and uh, eight priority policies. The projects fall into four buckets, premium transit corridors and complete streets, uh, regional economic development projects, um, downtown and central city access, and then bicycle and pedestrian network. 
premium transit corridors and complete streets. Uh, one thing I'll say right off the bat, there is no plan for light rail and move global. Um, we are, when we looked at this with our consultant, Nelson Nygaard, they really looked at, again, what could we support? Do we have the, do we have the um, ability right now to, to really support that upfront capital cost? And what they, what they came back with was, well, for a, for a fully integrated light rail system, that's probably not uh, a feasible thing for Jefferson County to do at this time. However, what they did say was you want to look at, your, your citizens are clearly demanding a better form of transportation, uh, mass transit. So uh, what they said was, let's, let's talk about transit that is fast, reliable, identifiable stops or stations, uh, and is providing and looking at frequent service. So they, we coined this phrase premium transit, and that's really what we're talking about. And as we talk about the, the, the three projects here, uh, on this, uh, four projects here on the screen, we're talking about premium transit. And other than Dixie Highway, that what premium is, what format takes is not defined. So we'll have to study those uh, three in, in depth. They're priced out in the Move Global Plan as bus rapid transit, um, but uh, that that could change as, as conditions change throughout the county. So those projects, the number one project in Move Global, the number one comment that we heard from public was. We need to get from east to west on transit without going through downtown. So providing east-west transit connection uh, that is fast, frequent, reliable. Again, that premium transit connection. So uh, that's that was the number one thing we heard. Transforming <coughs> Dixie Highway. It's a project that we're already working on. Um, making Broadway a complete street and premium transit corridor, and then. Um, looking at Preston Highway as a premium transit corridor. So Preston, Broadway, and Dixie, those are the primarily served by the 23 and 18 routes. Those are the two high, highest ridership lines in the TARP system right now. So lots of transit demand, lots of access to jobs on those two lines. This is a vision of what Broadway could look like. This is you know, the vision, so just again, show the, the bicycle pedestrian and the, the bus lanes. The regional economic development projects, uh, again, we're looking at, you know, where, where's the growth currently happening in Jefferson County? And primarily it's happening to, to the east. So what do we do to try to uh, relieve the congestion that's existing in the east while um, focusing on uh, supporting that economic development that's happening around uh, the parklands and uh, east point developments? So what the, what the projects that are up here are the, um, the Oxmoor Farms, obviously that's a, a key parcel between the two mall, or outside of the 264, just east of Oxmoor uh, Center, looking at redeveloping that parcel and providing the transportation network that can make that. But also key to that particular project would be providing that uh, uh, pedestrian connection between the two malls. So uh, I suppose you could walk on Shelbyville Road if you wanted to under the interscope, but it might be. Be a little scary. Um, Erton Lane extension, uh, and then the providing the East Louisville connectivity again, providing the connectivity around the parklands of Floyd's Point, enhancing the road networks there. West Louisville, we've seen a lot of investment in West Louisville recently. Um, and our transportation network, while we have a strong grid, uh, we have a lot of maintenance needs in West Louisville. We also have a, a transportation grid that might not be supporting the economic development that's happening. Uh, the food court's a prime example of that, where they're going to locate there at 30th and Muhammad Ali Boulevard with the one-way street configurations are going to make it difficult to get trucks to uh, that facility without uh, interrupting the um, neighborhood surrounding it. Picture of Oxmoor Farm, so we like to throw up just in case uh, people don't know where Oxmoor Farm is. We don't have a pretty picture for that one, unfortunately. Downtown and the central city access. Uh, downtown, uh, as you saw, we have a lot of pedestrian crashes in downtown. I mean, the transportation network was not necessarily supporting the high level of pedestrian ac access that's downtown, so we think about reimagining our downtown and the neighborhoods that surround downtown uh, to provide. That, that critical access that we need and, and make sure that we are allowed for multimodal movement through downtown. So we have the project about reimagining Ninth Street, um, converting some of the one-way streets to two-way streets, um, completing River, making River Road a complete street and extending it into uh, Portland, specifically for the Waterfront Park Phase 4 project. Um, just redesigning the main and story intersections. We have a lot of redevelopment that's happening in the new Little and Butchertown areas in downtown. Uh, and the one-way street configuration that, in that intersection particularly, it a challenge to that development. 
And then uh, think about Lexington Road as a complete street, adding the sidewalks and again supporting economic development. So again, these projects are really focused on providing that vibrant urban, urban environment that is that's, is demanded, and also maintaining the access and, and making sure that people can walk safely in our downtown. Uh, and a vision for reimagining Ninth Street. And then finally, I mentioned the pedestrian <coughs> network. Um, these are absolutely critical to providing those last mile solutions for transit. So how can we get people to, uh, these, these are filling gaps in both of those systems. So filling critical gaps in our sidewalk network, which our sidewalk network has $112 million in critical gaps. So we have $112 million in need there. We have $112 million in paving needs, just to kind of put that in perspective. Um, the bike network, uh, we are, it is, it's, it's in, it's, in its infancy right now, we are we are starting to uh, gain some momentum there, uh, but we uh, have a bike show that's coming online and really completing that network is going to be helpful for people making those trips in and around downtown to think about using a bike versus, or walking versus uh, just driving from place to place. And then finally, the Louisville Loop, completing that, that recreational path and then creating the uh, links to the loop to really provide the healthy uh, recreation activities and uh, connections to it. Our eight policies, priorities are we need to shift and increase our funding allocation. We need to make complete street design principles the norm and strengthen our complete streets uh, practices in Metro. We need to prioritize those high capacity corridors. So streets like Dixie Highway, Bardstown, <coughs> Taylorsville Road. We need to focus development decisions around those corridors and think about how we're moving people around this community. Um, we need to start thinking about transit as a catalyst for infill development, not just a service, but a catalyst for how that we can start to fill some of the holes in the community. We need to streamline our transit service so it's more understandable, it gets people to where they're going faster, uh, and, it's, and it's really providing those connections that people need to get to jobs. We need to set a policy on our freight routes. We need to manage parkings that's specifically in the downtown, manage our parking system so that we are uh, oversupplied and underpriced right now, and then uh, embrace the smart mobility and the technologies that are coming our way. So again, just our, this is, so move mobile over 20 years, the priority maintenance and uh, projects are $1.4 billion over 20 years. That breaks down to $69.7 million annually. Just taking the baseline number that we have, uh, which is $14 million, we have a gap of about $56 million. That's all on the capital side, so we have an additional $30 million annually that we need to fill on the transit side. Um, and when we think about fixing our infrastructure first, which again is our number one priority, we think we think about fixing the potholes, fixing the broken sidewalks, but we're also thinking about the, our inter, our intersections that look like this. All too, this is at Gars and Dixie. All too often we have our intersections that look like this. Um, we have no crosswalk markings. We have a bench for buses. We have uh, large curb cuts. Um, I think they're making them look a little more like this. So uh, we have our we have the proper markings for the crosswalk. We have this this uh, shelter for the bus stop. And again, this is the Dixie and Guards. This is one of our town center locations on uh, Dixie Highway. So again, then finally, we need to think about moving a good so that we can keep our economy moving forward. So that is Move Global in a nutshell. It's fast. The document is online. It's available. You can comment online uh, through, our, through that form. Or uh, again, if you'd like, we are more than happy to come out and talk to your city, to your organization and dive a little bit deeper into the document and have a discussion and answer questions about some of the assumptions that we made. So we're happy to do that as well. Questions? You, you said, talk about parking there just a few months ago. You said you're, we're oversized and underpriced. What do you mean by that? We have too many parking spaces downtown and they are we are low when you look at our, we are the lowest when you look at our pure city. So we are at $74 a month. I think our next post is $85 a month. Uh, and what we have, we have a lot of parking downtown but what happens is, is we have we have demand, we have supply problems in certain parts of downtown where we have we don't have enough supply, we have too much demand and in other parts of downtown where we have way too much supply but no demand. So we have both in our that's both in our off street and on street parking system. Um, yeah. I'm curious if you have looked at the projects that are already in the pipeline through TIP and that sort of thing, yeah. and how much of that um, coordinates with these. And you know, if there's not much, you know, are, are we going to have to be looking at 
refocusing efforts and maybe you know taking money away from this and pushing it toward that type of thing. So that's good. We looked at all the projects in the in the tip and so every we looked at we actually looked at hundreds of projects and, and we did look at every single one of the tip and some of those projects are are appear in the local so things like the loop uh, river road those are projects that appear in here and here in the tip there's a handful of them I mean there's a lot of them where the the new projects that are in here are going to be primarily the transit projects so a lot of those projects are really focused on the better uh, for is Metro going to look at reevaluating some of their current priorities and maybe making some changes? Yeah, so we're in the process right now of looking at um, what our you know what our priorities are. This document is again out for public comment, so we're not in a, in a final stage. Right. So the next steps in this are going to be uh, taking the comments in, reevaluating the document, adding any making any changes that we think we need to make. Um, and then it will become a, it will we'll finalize the document, it will sit out as a kind of final guiding policy document, mm -hmm. and will eventually be incorporated into the new comprehensive plan as the mobility element. So that is when it will really become the policy. At this point in time, what we are doing is we are pursuing some of those projects that we think are important um, through our, uh, through our, uh, our budgeting process. Because I think this is a great, you know, long-term big picture document, which is exactly what it's intended to be. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Mary Lou, you ready? I am. Thank you very much. I wanted to um, let you know about some changes in the transportation improvement program. These are administrative modifications and are considered to be minor changes to the TIP that don't get through the full amendment process. Around the table, there is um, a, memo, a memo from me somewhere, and then there is a, a spreadsheet that's attached to it. Um, I have a couple of extra copies that somebody's been doing. Um, most, all of these projects are in Indiana. Um, most of them are in Floyd County. Don stole the show this week. Uh, <laughs> but what they are is um, Floyd County has uh, like nine uh, bridge rehab projects that they are taking out of the tip, and then, but they are adding two pavement rehab projects. Um, Gordon Pike and Grand Island Road. Um, and then the last project that's on the list, <coughs> excuse me, is in Clark County, it's Old Salem Road, and that's an NDOT project, and they're just moving the utility phase and, uh, for that. Um, so you can always um, ask me any questions about these, and if you think of them after you're back in your office or something, you can uh, email me or give me a call, and I'll answer those for you. I do, there's no action that's required on these because they are considered minor changes. Um, but I will um, offer a reminder to the Indiana partners. Um, there is going to be the five-year plan project review meeting to look at all the projects that we have programmed on uh, next Wednesday, June 1st at 1 o'clock, and it's in Clarksville at the town hall. And then another reminder real quick for Indiana is that tomorrow, um, the 27th at 10 o'clock in the Seymour District Office, there is a funding workshop meeting, um, and this is, uh, I think, rather important to find out how to apply for the um, the extra funds that have become available in Indiana. So that's all. I have. Thank you. Thank you. Other business? Anybody got anything to bring up? Well, y'all want to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Peace and happiness.